Oh, well, Rebecca, I'm Michelle Kwan's husband. <laughs> I love you, Michelle. You are the best and the most important thing that ever happened to me. And Mimi, thank you for believing in us and for inspiring generations of Rhode Islanders and for believing that Rhode Island can lead again. Mayor Palestina, your friendship, your commitment to service, and to your family has been a personal inspiration. I'm really thankful for your leadership today. And Victor, the courage of your commitment is an inspiration to me. I'm grateful for your friendship. And what you will do for the children of Rhode Island will be a guide to us in the months ahead. Te agradezco nuestra amistad. Me da mucha emoción lo que podremos lograr juntos. To all of you, I want to thank you for being here today. I stand before you humble by the stories, by the ideas, by the encouragement that Rhode Islanders have shared with me over the last few months. To me, as I know it is for all of you, Rhode Island has always been about family. When I was even younger than I am now, <laughs> I remember my grandfather would take me on runs, shuffles, and on those shuffles, he would point out the sites of history and share with me the lessons of Rhode Island's great history. And I remember on those shuffles sharing with him some of the concerns and the worries that I had. And in particular, the worry I had about public speaking. And <laughs> Grandpa would say, practice, practice, practice. You don't have to be the loudest voice. You just have to speak for those without a voice at all. Grandpa became more frail and lost his own voice. That was advice that I thought about often. And it's advice that I think about today as I wonder what he must be thinking as I address a crowd like this here in Providence. I would also like to recognize my mother and my sister who are here with us today. My parents uh, met a few blocks from here, students at the Rhode Island School of Science. My dad joined the Coast Guard straight out of RISD, and it was he who taught me where I came from, and taught me and instilled in me a love of the sea, and that wherever I might go in the world, that Rhode Island is my home. My father taught me to dream and never to fear. His dream was to be a businessman. He worked hard and with honesty to build a business and to make it grow. And like so many others at the time, his businesses got caught up in the savings and loan crisis at the beginning of the 1990s, when we spent a number of years in bankruptcy. What I remember about my dad during that time was how ashamed he felt. But that was never how I felt. I was proud of my dad. He had a dream, and he took a risk. And through it all, he took care of his family and all of those who depended on him. When my father developed cancer at the same time, I remember how he stared that awful foe in the face. He determined that he would never give up. And it was his values that brought me to this day. He spent those final months, as he always had, taking care of us and teaching us to dream. And I remember how he spent that final morning at Rhode Island Hospital, fighting, not for life, but just reading, but because it was who he was and who he taught us to be. So for me, as I know it is for all of us, Rhode Island is more than a place. It is our home, and it is worth fighting for. Rhode Island is about family. It is about 
the generation to come and building a future for them. And it is about the dreams that have yet to be achieved. And yet, as we look out from this convention center this morning, there are 50,000 Rhode Islanders looking for a job. This afternoon, thousands will head off to the second or third job of the day at wages well below their potential. Across the state, Rhode Islanders have been squeezed out of the middle class. Businesses have been burdened with process. The state government is often seen as an impediment, not as a partner. As I have spoken with people across the state, Rhode Islanders have shared with me a fear, a fear about the future, a fear that in this state their children may not be able to get a job and to grow them fear and a loss of hope that this state will be able to lead again. And yet, on this frigid morning, in the midst of all of these challenges, each of you has come here to stand with me. I believe I believe we must rise to the challenge of our generation. I believe I can offer a fresh perspective and a new approach to solving our problems. And I believe that I bring the values, skills, and the experience to lead Rhode Island to a better future. That is why I am announcing my candidacy for governor of the state of Rhode Island. And so that we can 
meet and al allocate our time, our effort, and our resources to areas of opportunity and to growth, even at a time of competing priorities and constrained budgets. Rhode Island, you see, once grew at the intersection of the, road, the global economy. And I believe that Rhode Island can grow there again. That's why, as governor, I will invest in our people, in our public schools and our education, and in those who want to start and grow businesses. That's why I will invest in our infrastructure, in our roads, in our ports, and our transit, so that people can get to their jobs, and so that people can flow through our state once again. But as with the Pell Grant, our investments must once again begin with our people. We cannot afford education policies that produce haves and have-nots. We must make higher education affordable again. Our focus must be on science, technology, engineering, and math, but also on language, and music, and art, and physical education. <laughs> These are areas that are too often pushed out and forgotten in public education, but they are essential to the growth of our students and to their future. We must respect our teachers and develop in our students and our classrooms the creativity to solve the challenges, the unpredictable challenges that they will face. And I believe we must invest in alternative career and technical pathways so that we can develop the skills of our workforce and so that our students can be aligned with the jobs that they need. That is why, as governor, I will make sure we have a strong career to school pipeline, working with schools across the state to make sure that there is an internship program available in every high school, and making sure that apprenticeship programs exist across the state, so that people and students and workers can build the skills that they need for the next generation. to make a difference in the economic development of this state. This afternoon, I will visit the International Engineering Program at the University of Rhode Island. This is a program where University of Rhode Island graduates earn a dual degree in engineering and in the world language, enabling them to get high-paying jobs, and a program that has already brought international business here to Rhode Island. We have to build on that success to grow these and similar programs and to link them to our K-12 system. Those were the types of opportunities that I oversaw while running the U.S. Department of Education's International and World Language Program. And it's those types of programs that we can lead here in Rhode Island. When our students graduate, we need to empower them to be able to stay in Rhode Island to find a job or to start a business. That is why, as governor, I will push for the creation of a $10 million fund that will enable entrepreneurs and businesses to access grants of $2,500 to $25,000. It may not be a lot to some people, but it makes an enormous difference to those who want to start a business. And $25,000, I believe, is a much better investment than spending $12.5 million bailing out someone else's mistake. And as we invest in our people and our businesses, we must also invest in our community in our family of 39 cities and towns. Between 2008 and 2012, direct local aid, excluding educational aid, 
fell by 70%. I pledge to renew the state's commitment to our cities and towns so that they can support the schools our students deserve and so that they can work toward property relief that our taxpayers need. As we empower our students, our businesses, and our communities, we must also invest in the infrastructure of our state, both for jobs now and for jobs in the future. We have to strengthen our bridges, our rail, and our transit system so that people can get to work. And we must invest in our ports and leverage our ocean. Over the past decade, we have seen incredible growth and development in both ports both the Quonset and the province. And we must plan for success and to enhance our co cooperation and our coordination so that goods can once again flow through our state. Not far from here, where uh, cars and trucks once rumbled by, the land opened up by the relocation of I-195 stands ready to be taken advantage of. It is an opportunity that comes by very rarely, once in a generation at that. And it is an opportunity that we will seize. We must invest in the parking and transit, transit infrastructure that will allow that open land to be used. And that is why I support and will fight for the proposed parking and transit terminals at the Garrity Court, Court Complex and at the train station. And finally, as someone who comes to, to politics from public service, I'm determined to restore faith in our state government. Insider politics and cronyism have held back our state for too long. When people and businesses outside Rhode Island think it's who you know, not what you know, they will not come here to do business. Government must be accessible and transparent to all, not just to a chosen few. And that is why, as candidate for governor, I will not accept contributions from PACs or from state lobbyists. I want to set up a I want to send a clear signal to all Rhode Islanders that my office as governor will be open to everyone, not just the select few and the powerful. That is my pledge to the people. transparency and the openness with which we hope to govern. And as we look at that campaign and the challenges that confront us as a state, we will take inspiration from the leaders who have come before us. We have been through difficult times before. I look in particular to one leader, to Governor Bruce Sumlin, a man I had the opportunity to know and respect as I grew up. Now, Governor Sunland was different from my grandfather in almost every national <laughs> But the two of them shared a common understanding, a common sense that to move Rhode Island together, you have to work across all the family of Rhode Island and bring people together for the future. We stand here today at the Convention Center as a testament to the leadership of Governor Bruce Sunland and to his commitment to bring together all parts of the Democratic family, labor and management, and all of our communities across the state in order to work together and invest in the future
at a difficult time. He was a man of big ideas, and under his leadership, our state fought beyond our borders, like when we built big things, like the airport terminal bears his name. <coughs> it's time for Rhode Island to come together, to bring in fresh perspectives and a new approach, to think big and beyond our borders once again. And that is why, as we do that, I will remember my advice the advice of my grandfather. It's not the volume of the voice that matters. It's whether you are speaking to those without a voice at all. And it is my pledge to uphold that tradition of public service as your next governor.